All right, good morning. It's Monday morning. We just got done with our roll. So we did get up on time today, which is just remarkable. Uh, we're gonna do helicopter and jet things today. I'll tell you more about it very soon. As I'm headed into the airport, I'm conscious that one of my aircraft flew this weekend. It flies every single weekend. And so when it gets back at base, when it gets to the hangar, I want to do what they call a post flight. A post flight inspection is like a pre flight inspection. However, a pilot does a pre flight inspection to find excuses not to fly or to ensure that the aircraft is safe to fly. A mechanic performs a post flight inspection to find a reason why it should not fly. Also, to perform basic servicing to ensure that it is ready to fly again. So when do you wanna do the post flight? Ideally, you wanna do the post flight as soon as possible. Now, there is one thing to be conscious of because we did say basic servicing of the aircraft. And there is a limitation there. You cannot service the tires while they're hot. So in one operation that I'm a team member of, they like to do some of the basic servicing procedures as part of the pre-flight. So in the pre-flight, they're gonna service the tires. All right, so that's something they do on pre-flight. While the tires are cold. Now, you can do a comparison check. If all the tires are hot, meaning the airplane just landed, you can check the tire pressure on each main tire. There's four main tires Three of them are, let's say, 250 PSI and one of them is 200 PSI, you could assume that that tire is low. But there's so many other determining factors in what caused that tire to heat or not heat. Meaning, were the, were the, uh, were the pilots uh, not as heavy on the left brake? You know, um, different things like that. Is there, you know, there's something. You're not you're not looking at the tires all in the same condition. But I did learn about the comparison check, and um, that it's a valuable tool to have in the toolbox. All right. So that's a little information on the post flight. Why we want to do them to ensure the aircraft is safe to fly and to find any reasons why it should not. When you want to do them, as soon as possible, just be conscious that if you're performing basic servicing task with the post flight, that there are some limiting factors, such as you can't service the tires while they're hot, and what the difference in between a pre-flight and post-flight is, which is a pre-flight, per the FAR, should be performed by a pilot, and a post-flight is performed by a mechanic. What's going on? Yeah, so it's a little dark. I'm okay with that if you are. At least you can see my hands. <laughs> Anywho, so I thought about several interesting things today that I would like to share with you. Um, the first thing I wanna share is there's all different types of fleets out there. Part 91. Um, which is privately owned aircraft. I'll have to figure out if that is the exact nomenclature for part 91, but that's what we know it as in the field. Part 121 aircraft, which is like airliners. Part 141, I believe that's flight school or the ability to receive uh, grant money, student loans, and such in order to facilitate the funding of one obtaining their license. I feel like I made that a lot more complicated than it needed to be. I also feel like you guys can't see me. 
However, I'm going to continue talking. A part 135 operation, which is a charter operation, which means I can pay you and you will take me somewhere in your aircraft. Almost like an airliner, but not quite. So the main operations is part 91, part 135, and part 145, when we're talking about most, most operations, that's what comes up. Part 91, part 135, part 145. Part 91 being privately owned aircraft. Part 135 meaning a charter operation. I can pay you and you will take me somewhere in that aircraft. Part 145, is an operation that basically has the ability to perform maintenance, right? So individuals who have their airframe and power plant license can perform maintenance. But if a operation has a 145 distinction, if they are a 145 operation, anyone that works for that operation can perform the duties as listed in the maintenance ma manual or the repair station manual of that part 145. So a 145 is a repair station, um, is what it's called, a 145 repair station. So that's the type of operation that's mentioned a lot. And we could talk about that. There's so much stuff that goes along with it, but basically it, it gives the company an AMP license. It gives the company the ability to work on aircraft. And again, there's a lot of other details that come along with that. So getting back to those thoughts that I had earlier, I thought about how with some aircraft you'll see, quote, normal wear and tear, unquote. With other operations, you may find things broken that wouldn't be broken in another operation. So let me give you an example of this. A flight school statistically has more things broken than a 135 or a charter aircraft why well it could be argued that you have new students student pilots getting inside of these aircraft owned by the flight school they don't look in great condition because this is this equipment is used to train these students and student pilots are learning how to operate things, okay? And quite frankly, they don't know how everything works. They don't know how much pressure can be applied before it gives. And it's not their aircraft. And again, it doesn't look in the best condition. So some student pilots are quite frankly, they're careless and things get broken. Knobs and hinges and plastic pieces and parts and they just don't treat it like their own stuff or they do not know how to treat it because they have no experience with this equipment or components or hardware in a charter aircraft maybe a private jet or a helicopter or you know a charter aircraft could be anything that you could fly someone in right well, if you're flying someone, they're not gonna treat it like their own stuff. They're gonna get in there, usually they're gonna sit still. They might touch the power outlet. They might, you know, push a button that says light on it. They might plug something into the head jet. But they're not gonna willy-nilly play with things and try to operate things not knowing how it works. Now, we're speaking generally, right? I'm sure that there is an exception to every rule 100 percent sure there's an exception to every rule actually so really sure there's an exception to these rules and 
I'm just kind of giving you my general opinion and just trying to draw a landscape and give you a bearing of some terms and some conversations and some ideas that an aviation professional would have. I use the term professional loosely. Anywho, so it occurred to me today while I was working on a fleet of flight school aircraft that there is a difference in between the, th the type of discrepancies that are reported. And every operation is different. And we can weigh out the pros and cons all day, but for now I just wanted to mention that um, and add it to the vlog. All right, I'm working on some more professional aircraft aviation maintenance videos for you guys. Um, but in the interim, I'm doing these vlogs uh, to give you guys, you know, constant content. Something to kind of fill the pipeline while I'm working on other things. And with that being said, see you guys soon. Good morning. Let's see, am I in focus? Yeah, I'm a little adjusting here. All right, done a little adjusting. We're still a little cricket. All right, there we go. All right, good morning. This is the end of the week. We've primarily worked on helicopters this week or this previous week, the week that this is currently becoming an end to. have jet things pressing however I can only be in one place at one time and when I'm in that environment I'm there I accept that whatever is not there is not being done and I make sure my mind is at one with my hands meaning I'm thinking about what I'm doing and no one can really truly do that 100% of the time, but that's the goal. We call that staying focused. And staying focused is extremely beneficial in every task that you perform, regardless of the environment that you're in. This can be applied at home, at work, when you're with your friends, when you're with a business acquaintance, even when you're doing something on your phone, right? It's dedicating your attention to that when that's what you're doing. So we worked on helicopters this week. And I've accepted the fact that everything that isn't in that hangar is not getting done. What have we done to a helicopter? Well, we finished up an annual inspection on an R66 helicopter, which is similar to the R44 helicopter, with the exception that it's twice, of, twice as expensive with a turbine engine with an extra seat, so five instead of four, slightly longer cord blades, and just a more, oh, an eight inch wider cabin, but all in all, it's a more comfortable ship with more power and twice the cost. So you're looking up towards, when we're talking about Robinson helicopters and value, we're looking at, you know, a Robinson uh, R44 helicopter uh, costs around $500,000, ballpark, 500 grand. And an R66 helicopter, yes, half, uh, at twice the amount, it costs a million dollars, uh, ballpark. I guess like you know those marketing marketing tactics like they might say that is nine hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars right just so they don't have to say a million <laughs> oh man but it's something like that maybe they come in at 980 who knows well we we would know if we really care if we went and look um helicopters 
really cool in that they provide a lot of free data on their website, which is absolutely remarkable and has more value than you know. Other manufacturers charge thousands of dollars for access to the maintenance data for the equipment that you've already purchased. However, it's also mandated by federal law that we have that information. So if we want to work on a certain aircraft, we're federally mandated to pay thousands of dollars for the maintenance data, for access to the current maintenance data to perform maintenance on an aircraft. It seems to me that if they actually cared about safe aircraft and wanted to empower operators to do the right thing, then they would make it more affordable to keep the aircraft safe by providing maintenance manuals at economical rates like that's one of the conversations had amongst the more professional more mature aviation professionals they recognize that a lot of Vendors, a lot of companies, third parties will take advantage of the profile that goes around corporate jets, i.e. this guy owns a $7 million jet, so we're going to price his part at $5,000 because he can afford it. If he can afford a $7 million jet, he can afford the $5,000 part. But if the $5,000 part only costs 75 bucks to make, at that point, are you really serving the community? Are you taking advantage of them? Are you, is it your duty to get the most out of what you can when you create a product? Is that your duty? I know we all believe in making money and being productive and contributing to society and taking care of our families. Obviously, that money has to come from somewhere. But do you do your customer like that? Where you mark it up so high. But hey, that's the name of the game. As an aircraft mechanic, you have to recognize that's the name of the game. And as a pilot, you have to know how to sell yourself because you can operate this equipment safely. However, this is also spoken about um, in the more mature aviation professional community is how pilots get taken advantage of. You can be a pilot who has Ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars in five years in aviation, making the necessary sacrifices, and still get pulled on into a company making you know fifty, sixty, seventy grand, maybe less, a lot less, a lot of the times. That's the problem. Maybe thirty, thirty-five, forty grand. Um, and you're operating a piece of equipment over everybody else's head. You know you're operating a piece of equipment that most people don't even know how to turn on. You're operating a sophisticated equipment with advanced technology that has taken you years and many hours of practice in order to operate safely and they offer you 30 or 45 grand. That's... But that's how the industry is. And these are conversations had.
I don't have the answer to these things. I can be creative in manufacture ideas. We all can. I'm still in my understanding phase, right? I'm no longer an apprentice. I am a journeyman working on my master and these are categories that I've pulled out of you know older craft training programs and the military where at first you're an apprentice and that's how you learn the craft but when you actually know how to exercise the craft but still need help with extremely complicated things or skills that takes you years to acquire, you consult with a master, you know, a master carpenter, a master mechanic, a master of that craft. So I'm a journeyman. I'm trying my best to understand, right, to become a master. That's where I would put me at my craft. Um, and I only say that because I've been doing it for like 10 years now. Not like, more than 10 years now. Been doing it for more than 10 years. I work on helicopters and jets. People consult with me. I get, I, I do projects by myself, you know, um, regardless of what that is. It's always good to have other guys around for an engine removal. I mean, I'm not saying that I like to work by myself all the time. That's definitely not, not the case. I'm glad my customers hire more than one contractor at times. You'll find that some, I'm talking to aircraft mechanics, pilots as well, there's some gigs out there for pilots. You'll find that I see a C-172. And it has like blue tarp over the wings, both of them. But on the right hand side, a third of the wing closest to the cabin, so the inboard portion of the wing is not covered with the tarp. But the horizontal and the vertical stabs look like they are. Here, I'll show you. I believe I'm tardy for a meeting. This is a vlog, right? I'm supposed to be letting you guys know what's going on. I'm sorry for a minute, before 9 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock. But you know what? That's how it is sometimes. Alright, this is going to be a really short video. I'm going to show you one of the best tools when you're working on Robinson helicopters. It's called a pick or an awl, and there's many uses for it. I'm going to show you a few of them and why it is important.